Meet the sheriffs. Let's go and introduce ourselves. Got an icon rate to attend here today. If it's not pie, we're going to be removing the stock. Their job is to get you your money back. It's about to get physical. It's the rest of all offence to stop me and do my job. If you've been ripped off and don't know where to turn... We need to deal with it now. We're going to remove vehicles to that value. If you're acting on his authority, pay it. If you've been to court but still not been paid what you're owed... Are you going to open this building, sir, or am I going to force entry into it? You need to pay this. It's time to call the sheriff. Oh, the on me. I'm going to call the locksmith. Effect entry into the premises and remove all the items. Whoa, 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 whoa. They're enforcement agents of the High Court, and the law says they're on your side. It's collected 42 grand. On a rainy morning in West Yorkshire, Sheriffs Pete Spencer and Dave Crabtree are heading deep into farming country, looking to get another member of the public the money that's rightfully theirs. Right, first job. I um, believe it's a farm that we're going to, so hopefully today there'll be some farming equipment. The man they're on their way to help is Lancashire farmer Brian Nutter. For over 20 years, Brian Nutter's life has been all about... ..sheep. Everybody says sheep are stupid, they're very clever as sheep. His passion for these woolly beasts has seen him develop into one of the fastest shearers in the northwest. I was 16 when I sheared my first sheep. Shearing, it's all where your feet go. They do say shearing 300 sheep a day is equivalent to running a marathon. Brian's steady hand and years of experience meant sheep owners flocked to engage his services. As his shearing business grew, it took him to farms across the country. But Brian's fortunes took a turn for the worse, when a local farmer came to him with an especially tough assignment. I've known him for a couple of years, but he asked me to shear his sheep. It was just short of 3,000. We sheared for him in total. A very big job. The scale of the job meant Brian needed help and took on two extra shearers to share the work. He struck a deal with the farmer at the going rate of one pound per sheep. After five exhausting days providing much needed trims to each of the farmer's 2,968 sheep, Brian was looking forward to a well-earned payday. But with the huge crop of wool safely in the bag, despite numerous promises from the farmer, this much-needed payment never arrived. You trust people, but it's just a poor do when I go shear a sheep for a man that I know and won't pay me. He's no loyalty to people that work for him. He owes me £3,000 and I've paid my shearers nearly £2,000 of that money for the work that they did for me. So like nearly £5,000 out of pocket. He's made money out of me going shearing the sheep because he can sell his wool. So, yeah, you do get angry. Having been forced to pay his shearers out of his own savings, Brian was determined not to be fleeced. After two years without payment, he decided the only way to get his money was to sue the errant farmer. When the case went to court, the other farmer admitted liability and was ordered to repay the money. But despite the court's ruling, Brian found the farmer still wasn't ready to pay up what he owed. It took him three months before he, I got the first checks, and then I only got them because I went for them. And I said to him, if these are, if the checks are going to bounds, let me know and I won't put them in the bank. And he's told me that they will clear. And I said, the first two checks bounced, and the, the, the third one cleared, but he told me not to put that one in. So, I mean, I've been right with him all along, but he hasn't been right with me. With the other farmer breaking his promise to the court and having no other way of enforcing the agreement to pay, Brian's last hope of seeing his money now rests with the sheriffs. It's now down to Sheriffs Pete and Dave to give this country yarn its final twist. And when it comes to potentially removing livestock, Pete's not one to be sheepish. 
Unless he's sold them already, there's 3,000 sheep that we're going to see. We'll send Dave to round them up. <laughs> Potentially, they've got a value and they're owned by the debtors, so we, we can uh, move to sell to recover the outstanding debt. Before they can do anything, however, they've got to find the farm. Could be anywhere, can they? No, just ask her, ask her. She'll know. It could be, could be anywhere, don't you? Just over hill. And just over the hill, they find the farm they're looking for. They're on site for a few moments before the man they're after makes an appearance. Got a live eye caught, Rick. That's the reason for our attendance today. In the connection with the Mr. Brian Nutter. All right. Did he do some sheep shearing for you or something? Yeah. Yeah? yeah. Okay. This is uh, £4,038.74. Yeah. Outstanding, which is the reason for our visit. We've come to collect it. Right. Right. So, how would you like to pay? Oh. Cash, credit card, debit card? No, I, haven't got no, I haven't got no cash card or any credit card. I don't have any. Right, OK. So, uh, cash or, or bank transfer are the two options then for you? Well, not just right now, they're not, cos I ain't got no tip bank to do it with. At this point, our cameraman is asked to leave the farm. Pete and the farmer continue their discussions on the farm. Pete makes it clear that if the debt's not paid, the man's farming vehicles could be removed and auctioned to pay off the debt. In no doubt of the seriousness of the situation, the farmer agrees to pay, promising the money in the next five days. The farmer agrees to sign an official agreement, which lists his vehicles and livestock and gives the court ownership of them on paper at least. This ownership will revert back to him once he pays up. Pete's hopeful the farmer will be good to his word and pay up. After all, there are plenty of removable assets on his farm, including vehicles and livestock. If the money's not forthcoming, Pete will be straight back to remove them. He said he doesn't have a credit card, debit card, which you can probably believe. So he's going to be cash, he's going to get cash together, go into the, the bank and uh, make the payment. He seems quite confident he's going to come up with the, the full amount. So hopefully by Monday we'll, we'll sit in our, uh, our client's holding account. And a few days later, Brian Nutter got the phone call he's been waiting for since he first got in contact with the sheriffs. <laughs> well, he's paid the sheriff. That's all right, is that? Which has to happen yet. <laughs> Time will tell. <laughs> the good news is the payment cleared and Brian got his money in full. Me. I might get a mug here. It's that gorgeous one, eh? And I believe I can run a decent marathon. Thank you very much. Download Veely now. Enforcement agents, commonly known as sheriffs, can go anywhere in England and Wales to enforce a High Court writ. Got an High Court writ to attend here today. I've been yeah. sent a deer to the High Court writ to clear the debt. At commercial premises, Sheriffs are permitted to force entry to remove goods or return a building to its rightful owners. I'm going to call the locksmith then, sir. Effect entry into the premises and remove all the items. Sheriffs have collected almost £200 million in unpaid court judgments in the last three years. That's what we want to see, that coming out of the van. All cleared up, paid in full. A high court writ costs £60. If the sheriffs are successful, there's nothing more to pay. If they're unsuccessful, the only cost is a compliance fee of £75 plus VAT for each enforcement. He's done one. He's ran upstairs and hid. On their way to their latest job are sheriffs Mark Newton and Tony Smith. Just on our way up the M1 now to, to Luton. Uh, we've got a company called Carland Direct. Uh, the amount outstanding for this writ is £3,239. Carland Direct are a garage who sold a faulty car to one of their customers, Mariam Awan. They fixed the car, but then made her pay for repairs, so the matter ended up in court. Carland Direct didn't attend, and the court ruled in Mariam's favour. And now, she wants her money back. 
Arriving at Carl Anderek's vast Luton forecourt, Mark and Tony head for the main office. Can they convince the company they need to pay off this debt? Hello, mate. You right? Yeah. It's about a high court writ that's been issued. Who's um, for, sorry? Uh, Carl and Direct Limited. Oh, who's it from? Um, Mariam Awan. Talk outside if you don't mind. Yeah, yeah, no problem. Yeah. We're asked to leave the premises. The manager says he's just an employee and therefore can't initiate any payment. He says the company director is away and not back for a day or so. But Mark can't wait till tomorrow and says someone at the business is going to need to find the money today. In response, the manager changes his story. Instead of the next day, the boss is apparently arriving in a couple of hours and it's his job to pick him up from the airport. But Mark thinks there's something fishy about it all. I don't know. No, he says he's, uh, he says, well, he's coming back in two or three days. Now he's going to get him in an hour. But the manager's still sticking to his story. Mark asks which airport he's collecting the director from, and he's not entirely sure. Possibly Stansted, or maybe Heathrow. The man's inconsistent story is frustrating Mark. He's been there for an hour and a half, and there's no sign of any payment or a director allowed to make one. Tony decides to step things up. He's had an hour. What are you going to do? Start clamping that one, clamp that one and that Just clamp it. Clamp it. Not interested. Clamp it. I'm getting all dirty. Just fight around the bottom. I could do it properly. Just fight around the bottom. The manager is not happy at all about seeing one of the cars being clamped particularly as his own Porsche is sat on the forecourt. He's worried enough about it to drive off in it while Mark and Tony are busy with the Mercedes. Is he on his way to Heathrow? Wherever he's headed, Mark decides to open up a second front. He leaves Tony on the forecourt while he heads off in his van to the company director's home address to see if there's anybody there that could pay the debt. We've got an address for the director, which is just around the corner. So as he's gone off, I thought what we might do is pop round to the house around the corner. We're not getting anywhere, and I think he thinks we're just going to leave. So um, he's going to be in for a bit of a shock because we don't. Wow, what a surprise. Rather than being on its way to Heathrow, the manager's Porsche is outside the director's house. Mark thinks the manager's inside the house, but in fact, he's just around the corner in another car and not in a good mood. What's your problem, man? If you clamp a car, the car's worth 15 grand, that's three grand. What's your problem, dude? I'm trying to get out of the director. If you don't mind, sir, if you don't mind, stop filming me. I don't consent to you filming me. If you don't mind, please explain to me why are you here. If you clamped a vehicle, that's worth 15 grand. Yeah. That's three grand there. Because so... I'm trying to get out of the person, but it's yeah. nothing to do with you. Yeah. That's what you told me. Yeah, so why are you here then? Because I'm getting lied to constantly. Yeah. No, you're not. Yeah? Probably the uh, number, number's there on the board. The vehicle you clamped. Mm -hmm. Now, what's the next step? Because the We're going to remove it. You. I'm not going to wait. I told you that. I'm not going to continue to wait. Mark wants to know why, if the manager is just an employee, he's so worked up about Mark's attempts to get hold of the director. If it's nothing to do with you, right, it's a bit weird how the car that you drive turns up outside the director's home address, but it's nothing to do with you. You've obviously got something to hide if you're not telling me who you are. Why don't we get out of the road, because one of us is going to get run over in a minute. If you give me some time, the problem will be... We've given you time. I know, but look... We've been giving you... You've had an hour and a half. I know, but... One I've done thing nothing. Our director is not in the UK. We're trying to locate him and bring him to you. Well, you told me earlier he was coming in on a flight at 3 o'clock. That's correct. Uh, uh, and it's now time. 25 past 3, okay. and he's coming in a flight that's over, over an hour away from. You're going to pick him up, so he's not going to be here while you're standing here talking to me. Young, I phoned someone else to pick him up, OK? So please okay, bear well, with us. Well, I'm going to go back to the car yard, because yeah, we're getting bear, nowhere here. Please bear with us. We are trying to help you. OK. You know what I mean? OK. Mark heads back to Carl and Direct's forecourt. He still doesn't know where the company director is or where any money's coming from. If he doesn't get something soon, 
he'll reluctantly have to tow away the cars. I don't want to remove goods, you know, it just everyone ends up with more, more to do, you know, and, and basically at the end of it, it's the same result apart from the defendant. It's cost the defendant more money. It's a message that Tony, meanwhile, has been trying to get across to others at Carland Direct. He's warned them that if they don't pay up, the enforcement could escalate to a higher, more expensive stage. They got straight out of the fight room and he's coming back. Soon after, another Carland Direct employee emerges. He may not be the company director, but he does agree to pay. Carland Direct arranged for the money to get transferred in full. Although at times frustrating, Mark's got what he wanted from the job, a payment in full. Well, total was about two and a half hours on that job. Total collected was £3,239, of which they paid just over a thousand in cash and the rest on a debit card. It's another good result for the sheriffs. And more importantly, means Mariam Awan getting back the money a court of law says is rightfully hers. Carland Direct told us they buy and sell over 100 cars a month and inevitably have issues with a small number of them. They said where they do have problems, they deal with them. For every pound the sheriffs are asked to enforce, on average, they collect 93 pence. But despite their high ratio of success, life isn't always easy for them. Today, Sheriffs Mark and Tony are on the road again, this time on their way to meet one of their trickiest ever adversaries. We're off to East London, um, looking for a company called the QC Laboratory Limited. The amount we're looking for, this is £11,673. QC Laboratory made employee Teresa Kelly redundant after she'd worked for them for 23 years. An employment tribunal ruled she was sacked without proper procedure and wasn't paid the redundancy money, wages or holiday pay she was owed. So today, it's Mark's job to try and get her that money back. Down this alleyway, I think, mate. They arrive and pull up. They're looking for the company boss. After knocking at the office, a man answers and says he's not the boss, but that he does know him. Go off to the QC laboratory. Yeah, he left. Do you know how long ago they left? Oh, I went into liquidation before Christmas. Is it? The man says he runs a different company at the same address, but Mark wants proof the two are not connected and asked to see any letters or correspondence which might prove which company's based at the address. Has you ain't got like something just with that on, like postal-wise, have you? Just what? like a... Have I got something postal-wise? Yeah, just with... It's your f***ing joking. Why not you find postal-wise? I just can't change what it's out. We well, haven't got like a business rates bill? No. Phone bill? Gas bill? Electric bill? Don't pay no, no bill. bill? You got... So this... This whole building, you're saying to me, everything in here pays no bills at all. The man might be shy about his post, but suddenly he reveals some other crucial facts. He's the original founder of QC Laboratory Limited, and the current owner is his son. He says the company's now being wound up, and it's his job to settle its final debts. But the company's still... Not is... trading anymore. So what, you liquidated the company, is that what you're saying? The man goes inside and Mark follows him. To get his client's money, he might need to remove the remaining company assets. As it trades in specialist laboratory equipment, he's hoping there's plenty of machinery inside. But if he wants to remove it, he'll need to prove it still belongs to the company named on his writ. And moments later, bingo. Mark finds recent letters addressed to QC Laboratory and other evidence the company is still trading. Just got a calibration certificate for one of his machines here, which was done six days ago. So for a company that's uh, closing down or going into liquidation, I don't know why you'd bother getting your machines calibrated. How can this come in on the 1st of June, easy, which is mate. five Dead days easy. ago, for a company that liquidated six months ago? Yeah, because I'm signing up the assets. It's OK, but they're still assets. Things. They're still assets belonging to the company. No, there isn't any assets. Well, you're going to need to show me proof that none of this well, belongs. Uh, wait a minute. How can I show you proof? Well, if you can't, we're going to be removing it. Oh, well. 
Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah? Yeah, yeah. Okay. All right, well, I'll start listing the yeah. goods. No, no, no. Yeah. Yeah. The company assets are in line to be removed. Only problem is, the value of the aging machinery is unlikely to cover the £12,000 debt. And with the company being wound up, the man feels he's got little to lose by refusing to pay. So do you want to pay? I don't want to pay. You don't want to pay? What's it pay? The outstanding amount. What is it? Eleven thousand six hundred and seventy three pounds. Right, okay. Well we're gonna start moving goods in. I will not pay a penny. Right. You're not gonna pay a penny? Okay. It becomes clear that the man has no interest in settling the debt owed to his ex employee. I would not pay her one penny. I'll pay her a pound. That's all I think she's worth. Place clean. Well, if, if that's what the claimant wants oh, us to do, yeah. Fine, find that from her. Despite his machinery being in jeopardy, there's only one asset the man seems determined to hold on to. That pop coat is mine, all right, by the way. Huh? Pop coat is mine. <laughs> all right, I won't take that. Fortunately for us at this stage, the, the goods in there are not. We're never going to cover this debt and the machinery by the time we've got that out and taken that away, we're probably not even going to cover removal costs. So we're just in a position now where we're trying to sort of see if he wants to pay something. But obviously he has a, had a big falling out with the claimant and uh, doesn't want to pay. So we'll hang on in here for a while and we'll list all the goods and uh, see where we go from here really. Look, if you can't pay anything today, they're going to... Okay. Right. Okay. No, not a pound. Well, let's, be, like let's be sensible about this. With little of value on site and with the company representative uncooperative, it's now down to whether Mark can persuade him it's in his interest to pay. We'll see how he gets on later. <laughs> this is New York near Boston, in Lincolnshire. It may not have Manhattan skyline, but for Keith and Chris Pebbody, it was the dream life in the country they wanted after deciding to move from their home of 20 years in Dorset. I fell in love with it as soon as I saw it. We put it in an offer the following day, and luckily for us, it was accepted. Unfortunately, this move was also the start of their troubles. Once the Pebbadies decided to move house, they knew it was going to be no small task. We'd been in our old house for 20 years, so we had a lot of, a lot of sort of furniture, um, stuff in the garage. Looking round for a removals company, they wanted a firm that would take the stress out of the ordeal. And after searching online, they found local Dorset firm Christchurch Removals. Chris spoke to the company boss. He was very convincing that he would do a very good job and take care of our possessions. So we went with him. It's the biggest mistake we made. At first, the 170 mile move went well. The Pebbadies were quite happy with the way the company packed their stuff and moved it out of their Dorset home. But when they got up to their new New York house, the removers started to look anything but professional. There was a reproduction Victorian bedroom chair, which was badly scratched. The top was snapped off of a garden parasol. He told me that I could glue it together. There was some shelving that was broken, concrete planter that was smashed. Our dining room table was scratched very badly. Upset about the damage, the Pebbadies paid £900 to have their table restored, which with the other estimated repair costs, left them wanting just over £1,000 from Christchurch removals. Keith then got in touch with the company. First of all, we put our complaint in writing to um, Christchurch removals, along with an estimate for the damage to the table, which was the major item. And I don't think there was any response at all from them and it just got increasingly difficult to get any communication going with them at all. After a month of trying to get in contact, the boss of the company agreed to come to New York 
and inspect the damage. But he didn't want to resolve the problem, and no refund of any sort was forthcoming. Nine months on from their move, insulted at how they'd been treated and still without any sign of compensation, the Pebbadies felt they had no choice but to take Christchurch removals to court. The company told the court their insurers were dealing with the issue, but unimpressed by this defence, the judge awarded £1,085 in the Pebbadies' favour. Since then, there's been no sign of any payment, so Chris and Keith have had to call on the help of the sheriffs. It's still early in the morning when sheriffs Lawrence Grix and Kev McNally arrive at the company address, which also happens to be the boss's house. So I'm going to transit on the drive. No sooner have they arrived than Lawrence spots a potentially removable van on the driveway. Kev parks across it to make sure it's going nowhere. <laughs> It looks like they've got a dog. Yeah, brilliant. I'm not getting bitten again. Right, it's locked. Sheriffs are legally allowed to climb gates or perimeter walls and fences to gain entry, even at residential addresses. Luckily, today, Lawrence manages to find the handle. You got a front door there? Give me the bailiff knock. Lawrence's knock has the desired effect, as a bleary-eyed man comes to the door. My name's Mr. Griggs. I'm here today to execute a high court writ against Christchurch removals. The man says there's no one else in but him. Nobody lives here, just you. Right, so who's Christchurch removals? Is that your mum and dad, is it? Right, and the van out the front, is that Christchurch removals van? You've no idea. You don't work for them. It's not your van. The man says his parents run the business and that they're away. You're able to get one of them on the phone? You must be able to contact them. If something happens, you need to be able to contact them, don't you? Well, something's happened. Well, I've woke you up, you can wake them up. Because at the, mo at the moment, we're here to clear this particular debt that we've got, which, as it's looking at the moment, is going to be the van out the front. You've just said it's not yours. It relates you know, potentially to a removals business, so we're going to be looking to save that vehicle, so you need to get your parents on the phone. I've woken you, woken you up, it's only fair you wake them up, yeah? The man says he knows his rights and that Lawrence has to get off the property. No, I don't. So you clearly don't know your rights. Getting the door slammed in their faces brings the discussion to an end. If he's going to get any money back for the Pebbadies, Lawrence will need to get in touch with the owners, and to do that, he needs their son to help him make contact. Lawrence turns his attention to the van on the drive. It could become a useful bargaining chip to lure the son back out. Yeah, definitely useful work. Yeah. What is this stuff in the front? Tom Tom Street Atlas. And there's like a webbing strap. Time to clamp the van. Get a sticker clamp on it and sit in the van. Yeah. Yeah, Usually, seeing the clamp go on is enough to get the debtors to pay up, but today, there's a problem. Lawrence, where's it supposed to be? Oh, you're joking me. Oh, I'm going to have a laugh. <laughs> it should be there, shouldn't it? Yeah. yeah. That's the point. With no clamp and no debtor to talk to, Lawrence and Kev are limited in what they can do. They decide to wait it out until either the office opens so they can check on the ownership of the van and potentially get it towed, or the debtor agrees to talk to them. But this, this is potentially worst case scenario with a, with a residential address, isn't it? Yeah. Really, we need to, to be in dialogue and then we can establish who is the owner of the vehicle and whether we can actually take it or not. It's a 200 mile round trip for the sheriffs and the chances of getting any money seem to be fading. Until suddenly, the sun re-emerges. Worried that the van's going to be removed, he wants to show Lawrence paperwork, which he thinks proves the van's owned personally by his father, not Christchurch removals. As this quite clearly states on it, 
this document is not proof of ownership. We need some kind of proof of ownership or we'll be taking it. It's as simple as that. If we have to take a vehicle, um, sure. you're going to be liable for more money, so I mean, the best way to deal with it is get it paid. Yeah, you need to get them on the phone. It's, you know, that's what phones are for, for contacting people when they're, when they're not around. <laughs> Getting somewhere, slowly. Yeah. Maybe. Well, he's dealing with it now, isn't he? That's the thing, he's, you know, mm. he's actively dealing with it, which is what you need. Finally, after another wait, the son emerges prepared to pay up. Did you get in touch with him or are you just going to...? I phoned them up and said just pay it, so... Yeah. Just, 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 yeah, it's not a huge amount of money as well, you know, it's best to get these things sorted. Locked out of a residential property and with no clamp, at one point all wasn't looking good for Lawrence and Kev, so they're understandably delighted to have got her paid in full. Yeah. Oh, you've just met the A-beam. <laughs> Absolutely blind this last of a, uh, a residential for you know, what was potentially a non-entity. That's as good as it gets on that one. It's been a successful morning for the sheriffs. A paid in full for them and for the Pebbadies, finally a letter in the post. The payment. Oh, we got the cheque. Um, it says we have made a payment to you of £1,222.59 in full payment of the above matter. Got a check oh, that's good. Amount. Yeah. We weren't sure at any stage whether we were actually ever going to get paid or not. We're just happy that it's all over and we can get on with our lives now. Christchurch Removals told us the Pebbadies refused an offer from the company's insurers. The company boss said he had now retired and that the company was no longer trading. Back in Essex, and Mark and Tony are still on the premises of QC Laboratory Limited, trying to convince the company's former owner to pay up the £12,000 owed to former employee Teresa Kelly. She'd worked for the company for 23 years before she was made redundant without receiving the payment she was owed. But I would not pay her one penny. Unfortunately, the man is proving a handful. Unwilling to pay up and only too aware of the limited value of those company assets on site. All right. Are you going to pay any money? No. I, you, yeah, I told you, one pound. No. What's it then? Any sensible amount of no. money. No? No, I'm not. I'm, well, I'm, I'm, I'm not connected to a business. I'm here trying to get rid of its debts. Yeah. Right? But this is one of its debts. So do you want us to give us some money? Alex? Yeah, tell Not a, no, not a pound. Don't go on about a pound. No. How do you think I'll become so rich? Never parting with more than a pound. That's yeah. right, mate. You get it right. Yeah. yeah. Mark's having little luck getting payment, and the man has threats of his own. Now, can I lock you in? No. Before I go for lunch? No, you, no, you can't, can't lock us in. Why not? Is that a big... Imprisonment, though. Imprisonment. Oh, Kidnapping, isn't it? Oh. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. you have your nick for that. Mm -hmm. oh. Nick? Yeah. What, you want to get three square meals a day in a television snooker and a gym? Mm. Oh. You look like you need, you know, you want a gym. gym oh, what? You look like you want to go to the gym. <laughs> <laughs> I'm 73, mate. I am <laughs> naked. You my last job. With the man refusing to budge, there's not much more Mark can do. He lists what assets he can see on paper, but they're not worth much, and the former owner knows it. And with that, Mark and Tony call it a day. Right, we're leaving a list of goods with you. We're not going to take them. Oh, right. You've got seven days yeah. in which to prove yeah. that they don't belong to the company. Right. We can come back, though, at any time. Any time you like. No, yeah, even if you're not here, we can come back. Yeah, and full century. And full century to remove these goods. Well, if you can. I don't care. I've got nothing. I've got right. no strings. Right, right, you cannot take them goods out of here now. I don't want it. No, but you can't. I'm I just don't letting want you know. To. All right, but I'm letting you know. Oh, yeah. Them, mate. I can retire early. Let's go. Right. This is doing my brain. Oh, okay. <laughs> Come on. Come on. Come on. All right, have you left it? All Don't right. leave. <laughs> I enjoyed your company, Harry. See you later. Seven days. Or maybe not, if you pay. Oh, no, I'd say that. Yeah? Because I've got to start right. working hard. Okay. We've just listed the goods that we're leaving because it's just, we're not going to get anywhere. It's been a tricky trip for Mark. He's played everything by the book, but when there's nothing in the way of assets to use as leverage, even sheriffs can hit a brick wall. 
the goods in there were, were of no value. He just seemed quite happy to say that he'd give us a quid constantly. And I actually do think if we did go to that extreme with him and start taking everything out there and cleared that whole place out, I just think he'd go, well, whatever, I'll just go home. Yeah. I don't think he's that bothered. And since we filmed, no payments have been made. With no assets of any value on site, the sheriffs have had to close the case. In the van and on the M4 to Bristol are Sheriffs Lawrence and Kev. They've been specially hired to pay a visit to a major multinational company. The man that's hired them is solicitor Amar Alias. He specializes in fighting for compensation for people that have suffered deafness through working in noisy environments. And he recently took on the case of John. John worked for aircraft manufacturing giant Airbus UK and its predecessors for over 28 years. John worked in a department where they would assemble the wings of aircrafts. The last 10 years of his working uh, at Airbus, he worked on the jig uh, as an assembler. He would use a lot of drills. These were extremely noisy. There was air tools as well and there were many other banging noises surrounding. This is the North Wales factory where John, who doesn't want to appear on camera, worked. But after nearly 30 years with the company, it was clear his health wasn't what it had been. Suffering from heart problems, he was forced to take early retirement. Soon after, his hearing worsened and he was diagnosed with tinnitus. The tinnitus was quite severe. So if you could imagine uh, spending 20 minutes every hour having a hissing and a buzzing noise in your ears every day, it's very depressing and at times uh, your confidence is very, very low because you, you cannot hear people. John's hearing was so bad he couldn't get another job and the loss of income meant he found himself at risk of losing something else as well. John, due to his early retirement, has financial issues. Uh, he's had problems with his, uh, with his bank in terms of his mortgage. He's not been able to keep up with his mortgage repayments. The bank had an order to take a charge on his property and to sell the property. After suffering in less than silence for four years, John finally decided his hearing was so bad he had to take action. His case came to Amar, who sent him to an expert to assess his hearing. The medical expert gave uh, a report which states that John suffered 10 decibels of hearing loss. That is quite noticeable hearing loss. 10 decibels meant John had lost the same amount of hearing due to excessive noise at his job as a member of the public would expect to lose over half a lifetime of normal hearing loss. Armed with the expert's report, Amar set about taking John's claims to court. Despite numerous attempts to get a response from Airbus, they failed to contest the case. The judge ruled in John's favor and awarded him 31,000 pounds. It's money he desperately needs to buy specialist hearing aids not available on the NHS. Well, first and foremost, uh, John is going to invest in some hearing aids. They are in the region of five to 10,000 pounds. Secondly, this money is going to help in terms of paying the mortgage on time, keeping the bank away from taking uh, a charge on the property or getting an order from the court in terms of selling the property. Despite his court victory, Airbus UK have ignored all correspondence relating to payment and five months on, neither Amar nor John have seen any sign of the money. John's last hope of keeping his home and getting the hearing aid he needs lies with the sheriffs. And while John worked at Airbus's North Wales factory, it's the company's Bristol head office that Lawrence and Kev are on their way to this morning. We've just arrived in Bristol, and we're on our way at the moment to um, Airbus UK Limited, who owe just under £42,500. I'm not entirely sure what we're going to find when we get there, but if it's got assets, we can potentially remove them to be sold to clear the debt. And there's nothing that Lawrence won't consider removing to get his clients the money they're owed. 
if Airbus UK, or we have reason to believe that Airbus UK Limited owns a plane, then yes, we can remove that. We take something that's sponsored by Airbus. Well, what are you saying? Roundabout. <laughs> Arriving at Airbus UK HQ, they park up and head in. Security is heavy, unsurprisingly for one of the world's two largest aircraft manufacturers. We're asked not to enter the premises, but Lawrence and Kev go inside. The £42,000 thereafter may seem a lot, but for a company with revenues of over £26 billion, it's small change. But whether Lawrence can convince them of that remains to be seen. After a short time inside, Lawrence emerges. We're just waiting for somebody to come down and see us at the moment. The uh, gentleman just wanted a business card, so I'm taking them in a business card. But um, they've got somebody, they, they're aware of it, they're just looking into it now and then somebody's going to come down and see us so they know about the judgement. So um, hopefully we might be moving on. After threatening to remove Airbus UK property, Lawrence and Kev are led off to a nearby building while we continue to wait outside. John has been waiting nearly five months for payment from Airbus and so far got nothing. Lawrence and Kev, on the other hand, have been inside Airbus for less than an hour when finally they emerge. Basically, we collected full payment. They just needed to find somebody to deal with it. Um, and once they did, they took us down to, um, to the main office, really, where head of legal and head of accounts is, and uh, did a bank transfer for the full amount. So, another job paid in full. That's a staggering £42,426.51, including additional court and enforcement fees. Most importantly for John, it means he'll finally get his £10,000 hearing aids and make sure he won't lose his house to the bank. No wonder Lawrence is keen to share the good news. Just collected 42 grand off of um, Airbus. <laughs> Airbus told us the situation came about as a result of an administrative issue and that the matter has now been fully settled.